we, uh, we welcome you. We thank you for joining us online. We also uh, want to invite you. You're always welcome to come, come in person. We're going to begin singing Save My Soul. We are so grateful as we worship God for what he's done for us. Let's sing Save My Soul together. You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. Once again, you did it. You warmed us up to worship today. Thank you, praise team, so much, all of you. Well, welcome to First Baptist Church, North Kansas City. You may be seated. We are so very glad to have you with us today. We are here for one purpose, and that is to celebrate our life in Jesus Christ and to share that life with Jesus Christ and to point people to the one who has saved us, and his name is Jesus Christ. We're going to worship today, and we're glad you're a part of our worship service we do want to make you aware of a few things that are going on in the life of the church. One I want to recognize, she's not in here, but at least one family member is in here. Donna Carroll, a faithful member of First Baptist Church North Kansas City, turned 95 on July 15th. And so if you know Donna, you say happy birthday, belated happy birthday. That would be great. But also the family's invited us to 
celebrate that momentous occasion, 95 years, and most of her life she's been a member here at First Baptist Church North of Kansas City. So on August 3rd, Saturday, August 3rd at 11 a.m., our church family is going to just celebrate Donna Carroll and her 95th birthday. So I want to make sure that you're aware of that. Hey, listen, we have a big event coming up for the community. It's a back-to-school bash. So here's the deal. It is Tuesday, August the 6th. And it is really, truly about making connections with the community and meeting needs. And there will be children who need school supplies. And we can put a dent in that, and we can be a big help. And there are people that are actually expecting our help because we've done it before. And they're like, you're doing it again this year? Because they're going to need some support. So here's what you can do. A couple of things. One, you can be someone who provides the supplies. You can provide supplies by bringing them in, turning them into the church office. I know that a small group is kind of focused on glue sticks, and they're gathering glue sticks because hundreds and hundreds of kids will need them. But you can also donate to the church office and let them know it's for the back-to-school bash, and we can buy those supplies on Amazon, and they'll be delivered right to our front door. So either way, you can bring them in or we can order them. But that's one thing you can do. Another thing that you can do is just be a prayer intercessor. Be praying for the event, for the family, for the children, for the school year. Pray for connections to be made. And for the most important thing, that we have the opportunity to plant seeds of the gospel and share Jesus Christ and point people to Christ, well, we also help them with school supplies. And then, of course, you can be a participant. You can be here. You can be here in all kinds of capacities. We need people to be readers, people to be prayer intercessors, people to serve school supplies, pass them out. There's a place and a purpose for each of you to be here, so we invite you to be a part of that. Let Jackie Borneman know. She's right here. Wave your hand, Jackie. There you go. And she has shared her cell phone number up there. If you want to take a screenshot of that, then you can. She will help you find a place to serve that evening. We're so looking forward to that event. So remember the celebration of Donna Carroll's 95th birthday. Remember the Back to School Bash and the different ways you can participate. And with that, I just welcome you again to First Baptist Church, North Kansas City, and we're going to continue our worship at this time. Amen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? Who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance? The King of glory. King of glory, the king above all kings. If you're able to, let's stand and sing. This is amazing grace.
my sorrow, dead in my sin. Lost without hope, with no place to begin. Love made a way, let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life You can be seated. Jackie is coming to lead us in prayer. Good morning, church family. I'm a little short. The Bible tells us how important it is to pray for one another. Jesus gave us examples. Keep on praying, Matthew 7, 7. Pray at all times, Ephesians.
Ephesians 6, 18. Pray continually, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. It's that important. The Illuminate kids here at FBC and KC are their generation of prayer warriors. We got you guys. They know that prayer is a conversation with God. They share with each other effortlessly their needs, sickness, struggles, and desires that they have for themselves and for each other. They pray for missionaries, the church, for countries around the world. They pray that events that they participate will be fun. These kids, they get it. They really get it. These past three weeks, our Illuminate kids have done the corporate prayer here. Psalms 127, 3 reminds us that children are a gift from the Lord. And Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go. I am thankful to you parents, grandparents, and you church body. You are examples of these truths, and you are the ones that are examples to show them how important it is. Pray for each other. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we lift up our children here in our community and across this country and world. We know how important children are to you. Jesus, you told your followers to become like children, to enter the kingdom of heaven. Lord, teach each one of us the simplicity of childlike faith, love, and praises for you. I know your hand is on each one of these precious children and youth here. We ask you, Lord, to bring us a youth director. We trust your timing and provision. Father, in a couple weeks, we have a very important event coming up, the Back to School Bash. It will provide needed school supplies for kids in our community. Please bring families that not only need school supplies, but have spiritual needs as well. Help them feel loved and welcomed. As a church body, guide us to serve you by serving others. Bless us with donations, volunteers to serve, a fun outreach experience, and that all of this is done to glorify you. Lord, we ask that you fill this sanctuary with your Holy Spirit and be with the one who gives the message. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 We're going to have, we're going to take the offering while we do that. We're going to sing a song called Mediator. And Mediator comes right from the scripture from 1 Timothy. So this is the first time we've sung it. The song's been around, maybe you've heard it. But after the offering, if you uh, want to stand, want, I think you'll get the hang of at least the chorus and want to sing with us. There is only one God. There is only one mediator standing between God and man. He's the only way to salvation.
Thank you that you are our way. You're our mediator, it says in your word, so we can hang on to it. We know it's true. And we thank you for all of that, that we can praise and worship you this morning for that. Is the only one worthy of all this praise and worship. And God, all that we give you, we know is not enough. We want to give you all that we have. Be with Dan, Pastor Dan, as he preaches this morning. I just pray that... Uh, you anoint his delivery. Thank you that you've prepared him and uh, that he's ready to open up your word and preach it and deliver it. And God, that we would, that our hearts are right and ready. That we've made up our mind that when we see your word and there's a discrepancy in our lives, we're ready to change that. Give us the strength and obedience that, through your Holy Spirit to obey. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. good morning. Steve, good to see you, brother. <laughs> I love when uh, I get the opportunity to worship with you all here at First Baptist, and then especially when we have friends in from Cameron. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's like the trifecta. We've got three churches in one house here. There is one church. We meet at different geographies and different times, but there is one church, and I, I love to see that uh, exemplified when we get to worship together on Sunday morning. So thank you for being here, and uh, you can turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 21. Before we do, anybody watching the Royals this season? They're doing all right again. We've got a good season because we've got a good representative in Bobby Witt Jr., don't we? Nobody's ashamed to, to hop on a plane and travel around the world wearing a Bobby Witt Jr. jersey, right? Uh, we also have uh, another guy who wears a red jersey with 15 on it. Anybody know a uh, guy named Patrick something or other? Right? When, when we go anywhere in the world, we are not ashamed to represent Kansas City because Kansas City represents us, doesn't it? Bobby Witt, Patrick Mahomes, these guys represent us. We're uh, just a little over a month away from football season. Not only am I excited because I enjoy football, but it's hot right now, and football season signals the beginning of cooler weather. But when one of our teams is doing well, when a player on our team is doing well, or when the team as a whole is doing well, we like to be represented by those teams, don't we? We're, we're not ashamed and we're, we're proud, really, to say, I'm from Kansas City because we like that representation. It's not so much been that, that case my whole life. I'm 41 years old, having grown up in Kansas City. You could describe the sports scene in Kansas City for most of my life as mostly disappointing up until about seven or eight years ago. And so we're in a, we're in a good stretch right now. Uh, we, we don't so much like representation when it's shameful, when it's embarrassing, when it's less than stellar. Now, that's not to say that we don't have any hometown pride. I mean, gosh, during the, the worst of our seasons in Kansas City, we would still rock our Royals and Chiefs jerseys and say, this is our year. But we cringed a little, didn't we? Because deep down, we knew it probably wasn't. Well, the first time I uh, traveled out of the country, this was, I, I may have shared this with you all before, um, over 20 years ago, I traveled to England. And uh, I was living in Chicago at the time, and a friend of mine from the Chicagoland area said, listen, when you get to the UK, they don't have a real great impression of Yanks. So just in the interest of getting through travel, uh, unscathed, I recommend you put a Canadian flag pin on <laughs> because they can tell you're not British by your accent, but you might pass for uh, a Canadian. 
And so, uh, so I did. Um, because I, I wasn't, at that time, 20 years ago, massively uh, confident in the international view of us as United States citizens. And this proved true one morning. So I, I, while I was there, I lived for a couple months in the north of England, a little town called Wigan, and uh, came with the church that I was serving with to the south of England and stayed at a bed and breakfast overnight for a wedding of the next day. And I, I woke up that morning and I came downstairs from the bed to the breakfast, as you do at a bed and breakfast. And I sat down and the, the lady of the house uh, brought to me this beautiful full English breakfast. And she sat down and I think she was just trying to make conversation with me. I wasn't wearing my Canadian pin at the time. And she said, love, no one in, in America actually likes your president, do they? And I did not want to get into an argument. I wanted to enjoy my full English breakfast. And so I just kind of nervously laughed. And I said, well, it just depends on who you ask. And she said, well, I'm terribly sorry, love, about George W. Bush. And I don't know if she meant that she was sorry that she had brought it up and made things awkward or if she meant she was sorry that he was our president. But either way, it was, it was that sense that I had had growing up in Kansas City that there wasn't a real deep sense of pride in my representation. Whatever you may think about political representatives, when we're represented by someone, we're either proud of it or we're ashamed of it. Now, the problem as it relates to the verses that we're going to be getting into in Romans 5 is this, that we live in a highly individualistic society, but everyone has someone representing them before God the Father. Either Jesus or the first man, Adam. You're represented before God by either Adam or Jesus. Now, many of us in our pride think, I'll stand before God someday, and I'll be my own legal representation. Do you ever watch legal dramas, crime dramas? My wife and I just finished another one where the, the main suspect you know, got fed up with his representation, and he said, I'll just be my own representative, and you cringe. You go, no, you're, you're going to do a poor job, and you're going to be found guilty, and, and I, I know because we all know how dramas go. You're innocent. Don't represent yourself. But that's how many of us think that we're going to respond when we stand before the judge one day. We think that we'll represent ourselves. Well, uh, I've got bad news for you. If you think that you'll represent yourself before him, Adam is your representative. And we're going to see why that is such bad news as we look at the first couple verses of our text today, Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. It says this, Paul the Apostle writes this, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, in this way, death spread to all people, because all sinned. Past tense, that's weird, right? It's talking about Adam at the beginning of creation, and it says that death spread to all of us because all sinned. And you go, I wasn't there. You weren't at the Super Bowl either. I'm guessing. You certainly weren't on the field, but you have a representative. So when Paul says here at the end of verse 12, all sinned, we have to stop and, and ask ourselves this question, why am I counted guilty of Adam's sin? Adam's sin introduced death, which spread to all. Now Adam, at the beginning of creation, had this very unique dual ability that we don't have. Adam had the ability to either sin or not sin. He truly was given the opportunity to either sin or not sin. And likewise, he had a unique ability to either die or not die. You remember this in Genesis chapter 2 when God says to him, Adam, you can eat of any tree in the garden except of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You must not eat for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. He actually had the opportunity to not sin. He actually had the opportunity to not die. We don't have that luxury because he was our representative and he failed in that task. Between Adam and Moses, listen to what, listen to what Paul says in verse 14. 
Actually, we'll pick up in verse 13. He says, in fact, sin was in the world before the law, but sin is not charged to a person's account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin in the likeness of Adam's transgression. He is a type of the coming one. Theologians for years, for decades, for centuries, have discussed these verses and said that these are some of the most important and theologically jam-packed verses in all of Scripture. And we can read something like that and we go, I don't understand. Sin is not charged where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin in the likeness of Adam's transgression. Now, I'm reading from a translation that I love called the Christian Standard Bible. I love it because I think it's very faithful. I think it's also very easy to read, which is important because we need to understand what we read. And yet, I read those verses as someone who has given his life to the study and understanding of Scripture. And I read that and I go, that's a lot. Sin is not charged where there's no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin in the likeness of Adam's transgression. Why, before the law was given, did people die? Why did all of Adam's descendants from Adam to Moses Before the law was given, why did they all die? Well, the likeness of Adam's transgression that Paul is here talking about was that God had given Adam a specified command. What was it? You can eat of any tree in the garden except of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely... That's right. You will surely die. I'm proud of you guys. Not that you knew it, but that you used your voices, because we're Baptists, guys. Chill out. No, that's good. I, I, want, I want this to be a bit interactive, because I, wanna, I want you to think, and I want you to engage with what we're talking about here. So God gave Adam a specified command, don't eat of this particular tree, and he broke that specific law. And yet, between Adam's time and Moses' time, the law hadn't been given And yet people were still dying. Why? It was because they weren't sinning against God's commands. They were sinning against God's character. They weren't sinning against commands. They were sinning against God's character. And this is important for us to understand because as we read through all of the Old Testament that tells us this is sin, that's sin, this is sin, all of it points us to who God is. It shows us what God is like. What is sin? Sin is that which is contrary to the nature and character of God. The reason lying is sin is because God is truth. The reason that hatred is sin is that God is love. The reason that murder is sin is because God is the giver of life. So the reason that all of those who died from Adam to Moses before the law was given, the reason that they died was because they were sinning against God's character. So we ask, why am I counted guilty for Adam's sin? Well, Paul says it there at the end of verse 12, because all sinned. But we weren't on the field at the Super Bowl. We weren't on the field at the World Series. Why am I to believe that I sinned in the Garden of Eden? It's because Adam is my federal head. He's my representation before God. Now, the reason that having a representative before God bothers us is because we live in a highly individualistic society. We don't think in terms of covenant. And yet if you read scripture slowly and thoughtfully, you'll see that the way that God interacts with people from the very beginning is in the framework of covenant. The very first covenant that we see is between God and Adam, and it's called the covenant of works. You don't see that terminology in Genesis 2, but the idea of a covenant of works is present in the text. You say, well, if it doesn't say it in Genesis 2, I'm not going to believe it. Well, do you believe in the doctrine of the Trinity? We formulate these ideas and we put words to help us understand what Scripture teaches us, and what we find in Genesis 2 is what I have categorized as the covenant of works. 
We see covenants all throughout the Old Testament. I'll give you a few examples just to give you kind of a a system in which to understand these things. God interacts with Noah after the flood by giving him a covenant. That covenant promise was, I will never again destroy the earth with a flood. And he gave him a sign. Does anyone know what the sign of the covenant God made with Noah was? The rainbow, right? Right. God gave a covenant promise to Abraham when he said that he would be the father of many nations and that in his offspring all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And the sign of that covenant was circumcision. God gave King David on the throne a covenant promise where he said, you will always have a son on the throne. And in that covenant, it's actually a little bit tricky because we go, well, the rainbow is pretty evident. Circumcision is pretty evident. What's the sign of the covenant that God made with David? The sign is the throne. Not only the throne on which Solomon would sit, but the throne on which Christ sits. The true, better son of David. God keeps his covenant promises even when we fail, which we do every time. So God relates to us in this framework of covenant But the covenant that he entered into with Adam looked like this. For a covenant to take place, there had to be two parties entering into agreement. There had to be a powerful person in the covenant. This is God. And a less powerful person, that's Adam, who's completely dependent upon his creator. So God enters into this covenant with Adam on the condition of Adam's perfect obedience. If he sinned even in the slightest The covenant was broken, and he would receive not the promise, which is life, but the penalty, which is death. And God made this plain to him in Genesis 2.17 when he says, You shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. But Adam disobeyed. And as our representative, I'm going to teach you this word. Some of you will know this. Imputed guilt and death to us. Guilt and death was charged to our account. Even though we weren't the ones who actually sinned in the garden, our federal head, Adam, did, and we inherited from him the consequences of that disobedience, which is death. That's why all those from Adam to Moses died. Before the law was given, they still inherited the the guilt, the sin the sin nature. And yet, we're born with this nature that is prone to sin. Why do infants die? This is a touchy subject. We've had dear friends who have lost children in the womb, who have given birth to a child and it's only lived for a few hours. Why? If they've not actually sinned themselves, why do they die? Because Adam is their federal head. And they inherited from Adam this sin nature. Now, as as an aside, um, there is some disagreement about this within the body of Christ. And that's okay. But if you happen to be one who has lost a child before they've been able to understand the gospel and put their trust in Jesus, I want to give you some pastoral comfort That I believe that the children of believers who die in infancy are among God's chosen and that the blood of Christ is sufficient to atone for their sin. Yes, their sin. That's why they die. And that's a hard truth for us because we look at these cute little babies and we go, there's no way these babies don't sin. Give them 12 minutes. (laughs) And I'm not saying that when they cry in the crib and and they fuss and they're needing milk, that, that they're sinning. They're not. But sin is so inherited in our nature as fallen beings that no one has to teach those babies how to sin. They they don't become sinners when they sin. We're born sinners. That's why we sin. This is what we call the doctrine of original sin. It's what G.K. Chesterton, one uh, Christian apologist and philosopher, back in the day said Original sin is the only empirically verifiable doctrine. What does he mean by that? It means spend five minutes in a room with a toddler. (laughs) and You'll see, you don't have to teach them how to bite. You don't have to teach them how to lie. 
It's hardwired in us. That's unfair to many of us. That's unfair guilt. We go, my baby was not in the garden. How can she be counted guilty of Adam's sin? What we really mean is, how can I be held guilty for Adam's sin? That seems like unfair guilt. But I want to present to you this far greater idea than unfair guilt is the idea of unfair grace. The grace that we receive in Christ is incredibly unfair. And thank God. Because earlier we asked, why am I counted guilty for Adam's sin? But now I want to ask the question, why is Jesus counted guilty for my sin? Why is Jesus counted guilty for our sin? This is where the idea of dual imputation enters the conversation. Two things are being imputed to two different parties. Verse 15 says, but the gift is not like the trespass, for if by the one man's trespass the many died, how much more have the grace of God and the gift which comes through grace, the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflowed to many. There's a dual imputation in this verse. First, Christ's gifts are imputed to us. He says the gift is not like the what? The trespass. Christ's gifts are imputed to us and our trespasses are imputed to him. That's not fair. Verse 16, and the gift is not like the one man's sin because from one sin came the judgment resulting in condemnation, but from many trespasses came the gift resulting in justification. There's a dual imputation here again. Christ's justification is imputed to us and our condemnation is imputed to him. And if that weren't enough, Paul continues in verse 17. He says, if by the one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive the overflow of the grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? He gives us a third imputation where Christ's life is imputed to us and our death is imputed to him. That's not fair. And just when you think there can't be more, he continues in verse 18, so then, as through one trespass there is condemnation for everyone, so also through one righteous act there is justification leading to life for everyone. For just as through one man's disobedience, Adam, the many were made sinners, so also through the one man's obedience, that's Jesus, the many will be made righteous. And here we see that Christ's obedience is imputed to us. Our disobedience is imputed to him. That's not fair. It's not fair to Christ. But God knew this before he created the world. He wasn't surprised when Adam disobeyed the covenant stipulation of perfect obedience. God didn't create Adam and think like, fingers crossed, I, I sure hope that he obeys. God created, listen to this, God created in order to redeem us. He's glorified in this plan of redemption. The plan of redemption is not plan B. And the way that God entered into the covenant of works with Adam, he enters into a new covenant with his son called the covenant of grace. Whereas the parties of the covenant of works were God and man, which the name Adam, I don't know if you know this, the name Adam literally just means man. He is a historical person, but it's significant that God gives his creation this name, man. And God, in the covenant of works, entered into a covenant with man, with Adam. In the covenant of grace, God enters into a covenant with his son, the man, 
Jesus Christ. We just sang about it beautifully. There is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And in the covenant of grace, God enters into a covenant with Christ. What was the condition? The condition of the covenant of works with Adam was perfect obedience. Well, this is easy for us. Because in the covenant of grace, the condition applies the same. Perfect obedience. Except this time, instead of Adam, man, failing to perfectly obey, we have the God-man, Christ, who perfectly obeys his Father's law, who perfectly walks a sinless life, who was conceived sinlessly, who lived sinlessly, and who died for our sins sinlessly. The promise, again, is life. We receive Christ's blessing because he perfectly met that condition. That's grace. And yet, in this covenant of grace, you think, well, Jesus perfectly obeyed. He receives the promise. He distributes that to us. He imputes that to us on his behalf as our federal head. And yet, he incurs the penalty that we deserve for our covenant unfaithfulness. Christ took our penalty for our transgression that Paul talked about in verse 12, all sinned. Earlier in Romans, in 3.23, we, we read that all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And Jesus took that penalty. Now, there were the signs of the covenant that we mentioned earlier, weren't there? With the Noahic covenant, God gave the rainbow. With the Abrahamic covenant, God gave the sign of circumcision. With the Davidic covenant, God gave the throne. What was the sign of God's covenant with Adam? I don't think he asked him to be circumcised. I don't think there was a throne involved. There were no rainbows. What was the sign that God gave to Adam of this covenant? It was the tree of life. Well, in the same way, there is a, a sign of this new covenant of grace. And it's another tree. The tree that Christ was hanged on for our sins. What I'm not suggesting is that the cross itself is the covenant sign, but it is the object in which we place our faith. Not the inanimate object of the cross, but the Savior who hung upon that cross for us. The sign of the new covenant is faith. You could look up in the sky after the rain and see a rainbow and be reminded God made a promise and he keeps his promises. In the same way, we can see faith in the heart of the believer and be reminded God made a promise. Where there is faith, there is new life, and there is God's covenant faithfulness. That faith, that's not something you give him. That's something he's given to you. When you exercise faith, you don't get to go, all right, I really trust you, Jesus, and I feel pretty proud of that. No, that's, that's that Patrick Mahomes jersey all over again. We just go, this faith that I'm exercising, this is a gift from God. That's the sign of the new covenant. In perfectly obeying the conditions of the new covenant, the covenant of grace, and in incurring our penalty for covenant unfaithfulness, Christ dethroned guilt by grace. Listen again at verse 20 through the end of the chapter. Paul says, the law came along to multiply the trespass. This harkens back to what he was talking about earlier in verses 13 and 14. There's no law, there's no condemnation, and yet people are dying. God gives the law here in verse 20, and it magnifies our sinfulness. The law came along to multiply the trespass. I heard a story about a, a preacher who uh, stood before his congregation one Sunday morning and he just listed as many sins as he could possibly think of in Scripture. Scripture says this is a sin. It says this is a sin. It says this is a sin. 45 minutes, an hour long, an hour and a half sermon goes by, and all he's done is just talk about all these sins. He closes his Bible and prays and goes back to the back door and greets people on their way out. And one of the men in the congregation came by and shook his hand and said, Pastor, thank you for that sermon. There were a few sins I'd never heard of that I haven't tried yet. <laughs> the law came along to multiply the trespass. 
Sometimes there are things that we don't know are sin, and we read them in God's law, and there's something in our sin nature that gets excited. We go, I want to try that. But where sin is multiplied, Paul says, grace multiplies even more. So that, verse 21, just as sin reigned in death, sin was on its throne, so also grace will reign through righteousness, resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Friend, Christ dethroned guilt by grace. The gospel isn't fair. It is radically unfair. It is unbelievably unfair. And that's unbelievably good news. As we were looking at the first few verses, talking about the unfair guilt that we've received as the descendants of Adam, I think most of us probably felt to one degree or another the unfairness in that. We don't like that. We don't like that Adam fell and we incur the cost. But as we looked at verses 15 through 21, I think for many of us who have heard the gospel throughout much of our life and we've become comfortable with it, we don't really think about how unfair the gospel really is. And it should give us pause and we should say, Jesus didn't deserve to be guilty for my sin. He didn't deserve to die for my sin. And yet he did willingly, joyfully, for the joy that was set before him, Scripture tells us he endured the cross. That joy, many theologians will tell you the joy was you. You were that joy that was set before him. Now, I think the joy that was set before him was to bring glory to his Father in the plan of redemption. <laughs> and we're just the beneficiaries. We receive the blessing. We receive the benefit. But if we reject Adam as our federal head, if we go, nope, I just absolutely refuse to be represented by Adam, we have to give up the truth of Christ being our new federal head in the new covenant. Instead, we need to be humble and say, though Adam was my representative in the Garden of Eden, thank God I have a better representative in the Garden of Gethsemane who perfectly obeyed the conditions who took the penalty I deserved upon himself and who dethroned guilt by grace. Now, Christian in the room, I want to give you three things to do this week to apply this text. First of all, commit to studying the Bible. You go, well, I already read the Bible. Wonderful. Commit to studying the Bible this week. Dedicate time to reading it and explore even related topics to what we're talking about today. The historicity of Adam. If we say Adam was just a figure and that he wasn't a real historical figure, then that, that casts all kinds of doubt upon the entirety of Scripture. So spend time studying God's Word and learning about the historical evidence for Adam and write down insights and questions related to Romans 5 that we've looked at this morning Secondly, I, I want to invite you to cultivate genuine humility. It's pretty humbling to have Adam as our representative. One practical way you can do this is to intentionally seek opportunities to serve others. What would it look like if you treated everyone that you come in contact with this week like Jesus? If you loved them, if you served them, if you went out of your way to do good for them, as though they were Jesus. How different could your life look? Well, I think it will absolutely cultivate genuine humility in you. And what you can do as you do this is to reflect on your own sinfulness and write down instances where you recognize your need for grace because you've inherited a sin nature from Adam. So commit to studying the Bible, cultivate genuine humility, and third, celebrate God's deliverance through Christ. I want to invite you to reflect on how Christ has freed you from the consequences of sin. How he's liberated you, not just from the penalty of sin, but from bondage to sin. You don't have to sin anymore. You're going to. Listen, <laughs> spoiler alert. If, if you go, I'm just not going to sin this week. The minute you step out that door, maybe before, 
<laughs> you will go back on that promise. God's word tells us in, in 1 John, I write these things to you so that you might not sin, but if you do, you have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus, the righteous one. So reflect on how Christ has freed you from the consequences and bondage of sin and reflect upon the gift of justification and eternal life and how that gift impacts your daily life. But if you're in this room this morning and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, if you're not yet a Christian, I want to invite you to explore the message of Christianity, the gospel. I want to invite you to learn about Jesus Christ and his work to make us right with God. I want to invite you to reflect on the verses that we've just looked at from Romans 5 to understand the impact of Adam's sin and how Christ, the new Adam, offers hope for your eternal future. Gracious God, thank you for this plan of redemption that though we had a representative in Eden that disobeyed and plunged us into war with you, that you, before the foundations of the world were laid, you had set into motion this plan for your son Jesus to come and live among us, to walk with us, to sympathize with our weakness in every way, yet without sin. So Lord, I pray for everyone within the hearing of this proclamation of this good news, that today would be the day of salvation. If there's anyone in my hearing who has not yet trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of their sin, I pray that today would be that day. And if that's you, I want to invite you to come speak with me or Pastor Mike or any of the Christians around you. We would love to get you started on this journey with Jesus.
seated. If the deacons would come forward at this time and join me at the Lord's Supper table, we're going to observe communion together as a family of faith. So on the night of the Last Supper, Jesus welcomed his disciples into the upper room, and he washed their feet and he served them. And in large measure, we've invited the deacons here today as servant leaders in our family of faith to reflect that servitude of Jesus Christ as they will in a moment be serving each of us the bread and the cup. The elements that Jesus reminded us on that occasion of the Last Supper to do this in remembrance of me. But on that same very night, there was in the room and there was at the table both a betrayer and believers. Scripture tells us that Jesus took some bread and dipped it and gave it to the betrayer, Judas, and said to him, what you must do, go and do quickly. And that was to betray Jesus Christ. And then remained the believers 
And on that occasion of the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, Jesus broke some bread. He said, this is my body given to you. And he blessed it and they took it and they ate. And then he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And he blessed it and they took and they drank. And he said to them, do this in remembrance of me. So that's where we find ourselves this morning at the table. And if you are a believer, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've accepted him as Lord and Savior, if you've recognized that he represents you with grace and life and love, and that he is the one that represents you and covers you in righteousness, and you follow Jesus Christ into the baptismal waters, then these elements, this supper, is for you. And we invite each of you who are followers of Jesus Christ, believers, to take the bread and to take the cup. And as the deacons serve you to reflect and examine your life and your way and your walk, and to remember that he represents you with grace and to remember the cross and to claim your faith. So Deacon Allen will have elements that are already open if you need a kit that is already opened. And he'll have gluten-free if you need gluten-free. Please just raise your hand, get his attention, and he will be happy to serve you. The other deacons will serve the elements um, as well to the rest of us. I'm going to ask this of you, that you wait. That we wait until all have been served. And then, as the body of Christ, believers in Christ, united in Christ, that together, that we will take the elements.
have all been served. So Deacon Allen is going to give thanks for the bread, and then after he has done so, we will take the bread of Christ, the body of Christ given for us. We do uh, appreciate the sacrifice that was made on the cross and the body that was broken. Uh, we appreciate the fact that you were, were a willing sacrifice and that you, you, you willingly went through an agony so that we did not have to. And as Pastor Dan spoke about, that you were able to cover that sin that we have in each of our lives to make a pathway that we could come to you. So we're thankful again for this body that was broken for us. In your name we pray. Amen. The bread of life, body of Christ given for you. Deacon Darlene is going to give thanks for the cup, the blood of Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this, the sacrifice that you made. You said in your word that every time that we do this in remembrance of you, that we, that we will not forget that sacrifice. Thank you for being willing to shed your blood to cover our sins so that we might have eternal life and have fellowship and communion with you. And as we take this in a few minutes, we just pray that we remember that and thank you for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. The new covenant in the blood of Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you, deacons, for serving. And church family, if you would stand for our dismissal. <clears throat> Jesus Christ gave a new command. It was familiar but different. On the night of the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, love one another as I have loved you, as I have loved you. So to know Christ is to be directed to live as, me, as best we possibly can in his love for one another. Well, since God's word has been proclaimed, it's been preached and we praised and we worshiped because we have observed the communion and done it in remembrance of our Lord and Savior, that we've been reminded of his grace. I send you, church family, to go in the grace and the peace and love of Jesus Christ. We're dismissed. Thank you. My heart has been in your sights long before my first